Welcome to another edition of the Dogger Pass Podcast. This is for UFC Vegas 61. We got producer Megan behind the scenes doing all the sweet cuts. We got Cody Saftik on the line. Hasn't had a baby yet, but it's due any moment. Like maybe in the middle of this show, Cody could be running out to be a father. Could happen. Could happen. Um, yeah, we, we, I mean, nice little week off there, Cody. We got um, UFC fights. We got Bellator fights. We're going to be breaking down the UFC card, but... You know, maybe at the end we'll uh, we'll throw out a little bit of uh, love to the Bellator card because there's so much to bet on this weekend. It's a good weekend to be a combat sports fan. Uh, remember that this episode of the Dogger Pass podcast and all episodes of the Dogger Pass podcast are brought to you by Prize Picks. Use promo code DOP when making a new account um, to get a match deposit up to a hundred dollars. Let's get at her. And I actually like a prize picks number in Mackenzie Dern versus uh, Jan Jaunan. Minus 230, Mackenzie Dern is the favorite. Jan Jaunan can be had for plus 200. I mean, we talk about Mackenzie Dern's fights. It's the same thing every single time. World-class jiu-jitsu. If she gets you to the mat, you're in a world of trouble. She has a build. Like, she doesn't have great wrestling, but, like, just back takes from, like, standing positions, ability to make it really ugly against the cage and, and force you to the ground. That's all in her wheelhouse. Minus 230 on the money line does not really excite me at all. I really do think she is sub or bust. Like, if, she sta- if she's standing in this fight, She's going to get lit up um, in terms of the numbers. Dern has proven to be incredibly durable, incredibly tough, moves forward, takes those shots to, you know, capitalize on an opportunity to submit you. I'm going to pick Dern to win, but I would, even though it's not like that, you know, you know me, I like like the big juicy numbers. They're obviously not giving you the juicy, juicy numbers, but... Her inside the distance, I see out there at minus one, minus one eleven. So like basically pick them price. Like I really don't think that she gets the knockout. Minus one twenty, I see out there for submission. It's obviously early in the week. Minus one oh three is the best I see out there. Uh, Dern by submission. That's my official pick. What I like on Prize Picks is that they have the over under for minutes in this fight set to 22, 22 and a half minutes. Cody, that's four and a half rounds. If you notice. The over-under is 2.5 rounds, and it's minus 140 to the over minus or mi- minus 140 to the over two and a half, plus 110. So pretty close to even on two and a half rounds. You're getting probably about a round and a half of value on that prize picks line. So this is probably gonna end up like Costa versus Rockhold, where I lock it in, I make it my pillar piece of all, and then these girls go uh, go uh, the full five rounds. But love that play on prize picks. That's probably going to move. I, I would imagine it's going to move. And it's going to move pretty quick. So pays to tune into the show early. And yeah, Dern by sub. Nothing, uh, you know, nothing uh, razor sharp about that. But that's just how I see it playing out. What about you? Yeah, I mean, the thing with Mackenzie Dern is that, you know, if the fight does hit the ground, that she is going to dominate and she's going to look so smooth. The transitions just dominates. It flows from from just one position to the next. And that being said, the girl has a 9% takedown accuracy rate. So how does she get the fights to the ground? But she's one of the few fighters that gets away with pulling guard. You saw the Tisha Torres fight in the second round. She basically just jumps on top of her, starts wrenching on a Kimura. That allows her to get the fight to the ground. And when it gets there, she dominates. Now, Jan's definitely very tough, but we saw her in the Carlos Sparza fight two fights back that when Esparza got these fights to the ground, mind you, Spar is a dope wrestler mm-hmm. for the division anyways. Uh, when she gets the fight to the ground, she dominates for sure. If Mackenzie Dern gets the fight to the ground, it's going to be not easy money, but she, it'll, it'll. I don't see Jan getting back up. I see her either taking the back. If she submits her, sure. If not, it's going to be positional dominance. But this is a five-round fight, so she can, can she be trusted to do it you know, through and through? Uh, two fights back for her against Marina Rodriguez in the second round. She does get the takedown. She does win the second round. Three, four, and five, nothing. And yeah, the problem ra- with round two, if you extend round two by 10 seconds, that fight's over. 
Because, Paul, I mean, I remember, like, seeing people live tweet as soon as the fight hits the ground. It's like, this is other level. Like, she mm -hmm. is so unbelievably good on the ground. But Marina Rodriguez is known to have poor takedown defense. She gets taken down all the time. And yet, when Dern takes her down one time in the entire fight, it's like, okay, she's got a serious problem with her wrestling. How does she follow up that against Tisha Torres? Scores no takedowns, but does manage to get the fight to the ground by kind of just pulling guard and going for these positions. Against Jan, if she doesn't get the fight to the ground... She's going to get boxed up because Mackenzie Dern's just extremely one dimensional. So what you're saying with the money line makes total sense. If producer Pat shout out to producer Pat, but thank you, producer Megan for doing the show today. But Pat would tell you, you want to hammer this the other side all day long. And I wouldn't really be able to fault him. She's very one dimensional. She wins this fight, but hits the ground. She loses this fight. If she gets, if she can't. And then to, to that's very simplified. So to make it even more complex than that, just like the Rodriguez fight, if she does get the fight to the ground and doesn't submit her, you know, she's going to continuously have to do it rounds two, three, four, five, because it's a five round. So I don't know. This could be a good live betting spot. Like if Dern comes out there in the first round, gets her to the ground and, and submits her. Perfect. Everybody leaves happy. But if for whatever reason she gets her to the ground and Jan's shown some improved takedown defense, some improved submission defense. Um, yeah, maybe she's worth getting a, a better plus money as the thing goes on. But my normal style would try to get one of part of the main event onto my top ticket in this case i don't really want a whole lot of exposure to this fight but i suppose you would put dern in the spot and then hedge out that ticket for sure if you made it that far because yon's live in this spot the plus money does look quite good and even though i am picking dern and like you said dern by submission to me that makes the most logical sense just because the way esparza just smoked her like that she's 33 years old she's not going to get a whole lot better on the ground and dern's young and most definitely improving just you know, for the record, Tisha Torres has never been finished by anybody ever. She's probably one of the most durable fighters, not only in women's MMA, but it, pound for pound, Tisha's never been finished, and she's fought all the best fighters in her division. Mm -hmm. You got to give her some credibility. So I don't fault Mackenzie Dern for not subbing her. No one's ever done it, right? But in this spot against Jan, it might be a lot easier. And like you said, the Rodriguez fight, 10 more seconds. Like, she's got the capability of just buzzsawing her. She's also got the capability of showing that she's not quite well-rounded enough. So I will take Dern Dern by submission. But again, I mean, like I got my hesitations. 22 and a half minutes. That number is going to be gone. <clears throat> it may be gone by the time we finish <clears throat> recording. And then people are like, what are you talking about? That was never available. But hopefully we can, uh, we can find some other prize picks for me to match up with that. Moving on down with the card, we've got Randy Brown taking on Grandpa T, Francisco, Masaranduba, Trinaldo. Minus 330 for Randy Brown, plus 270 for Grandpa T. I mean, Cody, I think you know where I'm going with this. Are you going to actually do it? Really? You are? I love Grandpa T. I, I, trust I me, I, I look. I Randy. Look, Randy. Randy's an actual, you know, big 170. -er. I'm going to put, you know, put all the case points out there. I, I don't really love his boxing. You know, he's he's a little bit like he's a little bit shifty, but I don't know if it's like the most functional stuff that he's doing in there. He's going to have a massive reach advantage. No doubt about that. He's like six inches taller. But Grandpa T has been through the 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 ringer and back and the guy just keeps winning. Like it's incredible. It's incredible. If the you know, I think this fight should probably be more like a one, minus 170 plus 150 type of situation. I think Randy Randy Brown is the favorite for all of those things I said. Longer reach. People are talking about like a grappling advantage. I don't think he's going to be able to just take Grandpa T down and hold him. Um, or, and I don't think if he takes him down there, he's going to be able to submit him. Like that's really not in his wheelhouse. He hasn't been submitted since Kevin Lee back in 2017. He hasn't taken on too many uh, grapplers, in fairness. But Randy Brown isn't exactly a world-class grappler by any stretch of the imagination either. I don't know. I just Trinaldo's very good at just making his opponent fight down to his speed and pace. So I'm expecting kind of a slow-paced fight. I'm expecting a close fight. And if it's shifty and, you know, you know the way judges are these days, if it's even remotely close, I want to be holding a plus 270 ticket. So I'm picking Grandpa T on the program here. Um, I will be betting Grandpa T. I just wonder where this line goes. I figure, like, that's why I'm not, not in a rush. I figure, like, when weigh-ins happens, 
and people see Randy Brown absolutely towering over the former 155-pounder in Trinaldo, I mean, I feel like we maybe maybe we even get a better price than this. So, Grandpa T, for me, I'm I'm assuming it's Randy Brown for you. Yeah, I got to go Randy Brown for sure. I mean, listen, it, you are 100% right with Trinaldo. The guy just keeps winning. He's won five of his last six fights. And most of the time, he's cashing as a plus money guy. Because even though he's 44 years old, the guy just keeps himself in incredibly good shape. But yeah, one has to wonder that eventually he's going to get some bad matchups because of his winning streak. And it's going to end. And that's what's falling into this category. If you look at the guys that they've been giving him, it's guys that tend to shit in the apple pie, per se. Danny Hot Chocolate Roberts. Guy can't buy a win in the UFC, always blows it. Suspect ring IQ, not quite built for it. Believe re released from the division, no longer with them. Dwight Grant, my God. Dwight Grant, I believe released from the promotion as well. And just a guy that couldn't buy a win in the division, just doesn't have it. Low output, you know, outside of a little bit of flash of power. Can Trinaldo still compete with those guys? All day, all day. But look at the Muslim Salikov fight. Super low output. He has no idea how to gauge that distance from Salikov, who's just a superior striker. In Brown's case, I'm thinking much of the same. Superior striker, long, rangy. I can't say superior in like, yeah, like his technique is so much better. It's just that clean output. And Brown's one of these guys that must be an extremely hard worker in the gym because you see him time and time again come out and just be a much improved version of himself. Three fight winning streak, look good against uh, Alex Oliveira, choked him out in the first round. Picture perfect win over a guy that usually fades at the seven minute mark. So to smoke him out of there in two minutes, very impressive. The Jared Gooden fight, picture perfect game plan, smokes him. The Chaos Williams fight faces adversity. Lead leg gets chopped up, has to find that second gear. Williams is chucking bombs and keeping pace with them. But again, I really saw what I I I, I really liked what I saw out of him. Those clean improvements. And I think against Trinaldo, he's just going to be able to use his jab, use that straight right, use his footwork, stay to the outside, and just outpoint him. So Brown, Brown by decision, plus 125. Because Trinaldo, like you said, hasn't been submitted in a really long time and never been knocked down his entire career. 44 years old, like 40 pro fights, two-decade career. Uh, uh, guy has shown off some like legendary durability, right? So uh, I'm going to have to go with Randy Brown by decision. Moving on down the card, we've got Rowney Barcellos taking on Trevin Jones. Minus 235 Barcellos, plus 200 on Trevin Jones. Cody, he's your boy. Rowney's always been your boy, but he's kind of let you down over the last few years. Two times, two times. And he's a 35-year-old bantamweight. Like, he hasn't been technically knocked down in the UFC, but, like, the guy is taking some massive shots. He hasn't looked great in the process. I mean, that last time out against Victor Henry, who is also your boy, but like Victor Henry just just hit him at will, essentially. Like Rowney didn't really show much ability to get takedowns, especially in the first two rounds where he just didn't seem interested whatsoever in using his greatest path to victory in that fight. Um, is Rowney over? Is he over the hill? Is Trevin Jones about to catch a body here? Is, is that where we're going with this? Because I'm not going to lie. I'm tempted. You know me. I like I like betting underdogs. But Trevin Jones. Trevin Jones by knockout. I already see at like plus 575. But like, ooh. That seems pretty uh, pretty reasonable to me. I know Rowney's been tough. But Jones hits hard. Um, I expect Rowney to be winning all of the minutes of this fight until he loses. But I'll pick Trevin Jones for the purposes of this show. Don't know if I'm going to bet it. Not as confident as Grandpa T. Got to bet Grandpa T. Yeah, well, normally I'd be max betting Rowney Barcellos because that's how I love to uh, max bet my Rowney Barcellos. The guy's so well-rounded. But yeah, the UFC's really not done him dirty, but he fights a whole lot of killers. Not a whole lot. He's got a couple softies. But guys that float under the radar but are super tough matchups. So if you look at Saeed Nurmagomedov, Timor Valia, Victor Henry, they're all guys that don't have a whole lot of say or pull in the division. They're not top 15, top 10 guys. But they're massively talented, right? So Barcellos is always fighting at an elite level, but now, yeah, maybe doesn't pull the trigger. The last two especially is kind of been of a letdown. What I'm trying to tell myself to rattle myself up for this one to get up for it, that's like, yeah, Rowdy's going to go out there and do the damn thing, is again, when you look at the Timor Valia fight, it should have been a draw, first of all. He completely starched him in the second round, two knockdowns, put a mauling on him. 
and then takes his foot off the gas in the third, just walks him around, doesn't do anything. So loses the first, loses the third, should have had a 10-8 second, unfortunately, gets away from him. Valley of the elite level competitor, uh, Victor Henry. That version of Victor Henry that showed up was immaculate. He landed 101 significant strikes, right? Just, And then I think that's the key difference in my eyes. That's the key difference. Trevin Jones doesn't throw a whole lot of significant strikes. He routinely gets beaten to the punch. He's routinely kind of behind on the punch count. And like you mentioned, he's got that big power. So I kind of agree with you, Ryan. He's going to be winning the minutes of this fight. But does he get caught with that big one? Well, he's never been knocked down. He's taken some giant shots, as you mentioned. But he's for the most part, he's taken them, right? He's shown pretty good durability. He's a guy that's got excellent technical boxing offensively. Defensively, it seems like he's moving his head in transition, but he gets hit a whole lot. Hands low. Guy that wrestled on the Brazilian national team. High-level BJJ black belt. He's super well-rounded. Is he over the hill? Probably a tad. Probably a tad. But is that still enough to beat Trevin Jones? I think so. Because even though Jones is fighting, you know, again, high level as well, in the clinch, it seems like he can be kind of muscled around a little bit. If, if Rowney can't outright take him down, I think he'll still be able to just keep it upright, pin him up against the cage a little bit if he needs to. At range, I think Rowney's a slightly little bit faster, has more output, has the better hand combinations, better footwork. I would give the power advantage to Trevin Jones, as you mentioned, but I'm hoping that the difference in this fight is going to be Rowney, Barcelos, unanimous decision, 29-28 or 30-27, and the punch stats at the end of it will be like 89 for Barcelos, 60 for Trevin Jones, right? He's just got to output more output all three rounds, get the job done. But uh, I'm taking another shot with Rowney. The thing is I normally play Rowney very high, and now obviously I have to taper off my expectations because it does seem like he's slowing down ever so slightly. Yeah, that's fair enough. We'll see. I mean, Trev Trevin Jones by knockout plus five seventy five that I see out there. That is mighty tempting. I may I may end up with a little sprinkle on that. Not gonna lie. Uh, Sadiq, well, yeah, yeah, he's one of those guys I mean, that got a couple. You know, yeah, but you see if he wins, it's probably how it's gonna happen. Chaos, Chaos Williams. Okay, mm -hmm. Michelle Pereira. Uh, Abdul Razak Al Hassan. What do all these guys have in common? They come to the UFC. They absolutely starch two guys out the gate. Devonte Smith, right? You smash two guys right out the gate, and then everyone's like knockout puncher, and then it's like all your fights after that are all decisions. It's like what the hell, man? He's been fighting hell? good guys though. Like he's had his strength of schedule is impressive. Javi Bashara, we saw him a few weeks ago. Excellent. We obviously saw his brother, who's also in the UFC now. Great family. So, uh, Sadi Yokob Kakramanov, stud. Um, Mario Bautista, like, that guy keeps getting better. And Timur Valiev. Yeah, yeah, no, listen. Which, Javi which I mean, that's Javi that's writ written deal, down as a, right? as a no contest, but that's because he tested positive for weed. Yeah, I know, I know. There's another fight, by the way, that could have got stopped in the first round. Like, Trevin Jones was done. <clears throat> done. Absolutely done. And then, Wolf, MMA is the most beautiful sport in the world because they let it continue and he won in the second round. It was crazy. But and then outside of that crazy comeback, he knocks Amari Batista. That's fair. Batista's got potentially durability issues, but I'm high on Batista. So, credible win. And then his losses, like you said, absolute stud. So, you're getting a good line on the knockout, but uh, I would say just play the outright money line because it, it, the money line looks good on this one, too, if you're a Trevin Jones supporter. Order. And you would hate for Trevin Jones to just do what the last two guys done, and that's box up Rowney and, and, and you know, play his qu questionable ring IQ against him, and win a decision, and then it's like, damn, I had the right guy, but I chased that knockout prop. I guess it's juicy enough at 525, but if you like Trevin Jones, just play Trevin Jones' money line, I think. Nah, I'm going to play the knockout prop. <laughs> no, I, no, I, no. I think I think if it goes 15 minutes, I think Barcelos wins on volume. I think he that he probably mixes in some takedowns, is able to hold him into position. Like, I feel pretty knockout. Or, now, my, I, I guess there's some fear like Trevin Jones is like a black belt. He's not going to he's not going to sub Rowney, is he? No, no, no not chance. Right, but it's, maybe it's in knockout. the same breath, Rowney won't submit him, right? Yeah. It's, it's I'm, I'm, I'm adding it to my to my short list there, Cody. Trevin Jones by knockout plus 575. Moving on down the card, we've got Sadiq Yosef taking on Don Shainis. I don't know if I pronounced that right, but I mean, he's just a fresh, he's a warm body that they're bringing in for Sadiq Yosef, who's on a minus 1100 favorite. Shainis can be had for plus 750. What can you tell me about Don Shainis? Why is he here? Why is Sadiq a minus 1,100 favorite? 
I, I mean, is, is Don missing limbs or something? Like, what, what's the scoop here, buddy? Yeah, no, I don't know why the line's so big. I think it's basically because you've got one guy, Sodi Kusif, who's just extremely talented. People are high up on him. Uh, you know, sometimes makes questionable judgment calls while he's in the octagon. But I think it's just a supremely talented guy. On the other hand, Don Chanis is coming in short notice, UFC debut, taking on a, a guy that's kind of got him beat everywhere. But yeah, straight up, man, he's not that bad. He's not like as bad as the line would indicate. He's got a win over Kevin Brian, uh, Kevin Barbarena, which is Brian's brother, right? He got a uh, win over Chris Lencioni, Sunshine, Bellator veteran, BJJ, you know, high-level BJJ competitor, like solid all-around guy. And that one was a good decision win. And then he shows a knockout over uh, Cody Fister and this Bryce Picot, both early first-round knockouts. So he's kind of a guy that's decently well-rounded got mostly some power maybe he's going to go out there and clip so dq that would be like the absolute best path of victory is let your hands go early and and, and get this thing done uh you saw with so dq he's been wobbled a couple times in the ufc cleanly knocked down by arnold allen and again those guys are such a high level compared to uh the guy he's facing in this comp in this comp this fight but man, I just I, I I can't I can't pull the trigger on the underdog. It's gonna be like a puncher's chance scenario. I would take the under if anything, because maybe he's gonna come out wild and try to get the job done. But if he stays at range and tries to you know strike uh, in a technical striking ma match or kickboxing match with Sodik Yusef, he's gonna get sparked. So yeah, unfortunately for Don Shinus, I don't think this one's gonna go particularly well. What can you do with the money line? Not a whole lot, and I don't even really feel comfortable putting it on the first line like a Bo Nickel from contender series sure even though he's minus three thousand or minus two thousand every book gave you sure throw him on the top line because you know he's gonna win so to Yusuf's case like yeah he wins this fight but you know i'm not fully sold on him like he, he 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 gets hit in some spots he gets wobbled in some spots he fights to his opponent's level sometimes and doesn't exactly always give the best uh case of himself so even though I think he wins this fight, maybe I'm going to drop him down a little bit. And I'm going to go with the under. I think that one of these guys are getting clipped and getting put down. And, of course, I've got to go with the, the more talented, more proven, more experienced uh, guy in Sodi Yusef. So that's what I'm going to be taking. I'm looking at a little price shopping right now. And, um, you know, one of the sharper books out there, they have fight doesn't go to decision marked at minus 325 for that fight. And then a bunch of other books just opened up their markets. And it's minus 200 there right now. Or fight doesn't go the distance. Yeah. 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 So I would say, I'm, I mean, I am, I, I just pulled out my phone <laughs> <laughs> to, to cue that up. Because while we go through the rest of this program, I got to find something to parlay with that before it moves. Because I think that's that minus 200 is going to become minus 300 um, without a doubt. I, uh, I have a little bit more faith in this other book which you know they're not paying me nothing so why would i mention their name but um uh, they tend to have pretty sharp lines out there and uh if you look at shanice's record it's like this guy just goes out there and absolutely blasts on people or you know like he's going out there he's completely outmatched and he's taking uh and like you know when he does win he wins by finish sadiq's gotta you know put on a bit of a show here uh and prove that you know that he's worth his medal at, at, at that price. All right, moving on. Down. I got, I'm got. i getting a little flustered here. I'm just too excited about the potential value that's just sitting at my fingertips. All right, we got uh, John Castaneda taking on Daniel Willie Cat Santos, minus 185 Castaneda, plus 165 for Daniel Willie Cat. Um... It's an interesting fight. I, I've been actually... I was kind of like underrating... Castaneda a whole bunch of his early fights and he's impressed me and he's kind of showed that you know he's got skills in all realms of the game stand-up's pretty dangerous he's obviously got uh, decent jiu-jitsu skills um you know losing a decision of Nathaniel Wood doesn't look all that bad in retrospect losing based on the amount of volume I guess suppose I suppose it does Willie Cat was a guy I really liked on tape coming into the UFC he was in on short notice against Julio Arce. He got he got styled on. He got, you know, he got tripled up almost in strikes. It wasn't remotely competitive. I took a shot on, on him in that spot. I think they're kind of drawing him into a tough situation here against Castaneda. The one thing is that Castaneda hasn't really shown 
crazy amounts of volume on the feet in his own right. Um, is there a massive skill differential here in the grappling department that I'm missing? Because I do think it's probably a dogger pass situation taking Santos. If I think it's going to be like a 15 minute, you know, fight between these two guys, the strike totals are going to be relatively low. Uh, I'll lean towards Daniel Santos just on the fact that I think it's going to be relatively low volume. Santos throws with, with killer intent every single time that he's out there. He's plus 165. So that's my lean. Don't know if I'll get to it from a betting perspective. What about you? Yeah, so if you're a value boy, I think that this is probably one of the spots with Daniel Santos because, again, it's probably going to be a pretty competitive uh, fight. He's plus 165, decent enough plus money. I think it'll be competitive. I think he could win it. But with John Castanado, the thing that I like about him is that he's super durable and that he tends to just break opponents. Like, he's continuously coming at you. Miles John is very athletic, great wrestler, solid striking, a guy that does everything right, but he just continuously applied that pressure on him. He's 30 years old. He's really coming into his own right. His grappling is solid. His wrestling, okay. But again, I think it's his ability to just continuously come forward. When I look at Daniel Santos, is it Willie Cat or Wiley Cat? Regardless, the guy earned the nickname because he does show a ton of first-round finishes. His issue is that when he does not finish the fight in the first round, he tends for pace and grind to just take over. He slows down. He starts to miss. He doesn't throw as much. I think it's a very tough debut for him to come out into the UFC and he just completely gets, you know, behind on the punch stats. Will Castanato throw that, that much? No. Will this be way more competitive? Yeah, absolutely. But I feel like Castanato can mix in some wrestling. Uh, he'll have that forward pressure. And uh, in terms of the numbers, like Wiley is going to have to throw way more than he normally does. So I think I would lean towards Castanato still. But again, when I'm looking at this card and it's like who is potentially going to blow it as one of the favorites, Daniel Santos has good plus money. This thing probably does look a lot closer than the line suggests, and I wouldn't fault anybody at taking that shot. But for me, it's going to be that grind of Castaneda, and I'm interested in potentially getting a better line on John Castaneda live if, you know, listen, Daniel Santos is one of these guys that's going to throw explosive techniques. He's a, he, he's a hard-hitting Brazilian fighter. We see it time and time again. That first round, he's going to absolutely be live. But if John can kind of figure it out and you do like what you see out of him in the first round, but maybe he does lose it, I expect him to take over in the second and the third. So, um, yeah, I, I know I'm kind of puss-pussing out of this one, but uh, not faulting you for taking the shot on Santos, but I'm going to go with Cassidy not. Fair enough. All right, we got uh, Mike Davis taking on Vyacheslav Borshev. Mike Davis, a minus 175 favorite. Borshev can be had for plus 150. Who do you got, Cody? Yeah, so this is one that's probably going to get me in a lot of trouble because I'm going to go with the narrative on it. And the thing with Mike Davis is this guy is massively talented. I know a bunch of people that train with him, and they all gone out of their way to say this is the best guy in the room right now i knew a guy that was linked up with him at fusion xl not fusion xl is a bunch of older guys but uh between jacques ray souza and you know your alex nicholson's and your phil rose and all these guys they're like mike davis is pound for pound way smaller than these guys but pound for pound the most skilled guy excellent footwork excellent striking you see what he's capable of in the ufc the thing is in his personal life it's somewhat injuries it's somewhat like personal doubt, right? He's not one of these guys that's very active. He doesn't fight multiple times a year. He's willing to fight, you know, tough competitors, but you just don't see him as much. What you do see in the UFC is four fights with, you know, Thomas Gifford. Uh, well, actually, sorry, he's had three fights. A, a short nose debut against Gilbert Burns, which he took up at 170, so you can't fault him there. Thomas Gifford, man, what do you take out of a fight with Thomas Gifford? And then that Mason Jones fight where they absolutely threw down. Now, Davis is landing on him clean at will. You see he's got excellent striking technique. His striking defense is uh, pretty clean as well. Takedown defense, pretty clean. Uh, pace, cardio, it's all there. It's just, you know, the fight's almost two years ago at this point. So it's like, uh, is he getting better? From everything that I've heard, absolutely getting better. Dude is just still an animal, and you're going to see an excellent version of him. He's still only 29 years old. And if that's the what you're going to go with, then, you know, that's what I'm going with. He was originally supposed to fight Euros Medic on this card. Medic pulls out. Vlachislav Borshev comes in short notice. And... With, with, with Slava Claus, like the guy, great story, team alpha male guy, absolute banger on the feet, and everybody and their mother wants to just take him down when they fight him because it's like, don't stand up with him. He gives up a ton of takedowns. Generally, he's good at getting back up. He's always been good at getting back up when he gets taken down because he does give up a lot of takedowns. 
But in that last fight against Mark Dia Casey, he got straight smothered. Like he had zero answer for it. So this will be a better fight for him because Mike Davis probably won't utilize his wrestling as much and he'll stand in on exchange with him. And that at least you give him, you know, an opportunity to get going. But he relies too much on like a, a hook game. Like he throws a lot of wide, like uh, not wide, they're very tight and technical, but he likes to throw a lot of hooks and a lot of low kicks. And I think Davis is going to be able to just counter off of it. Use his jab, use his hand speed, use his straight right, get touching him up. Get playing to the outside. If he wants to mix in some takedowns to solidify the rounds, do that. Of course, he's definitely been working on his grappling with the guys over at Fusion XL. I think he gets the job done. But again, he's been off for two years. He might not have like full confidence in himself and belief in himself, which is never a good sign if you're a professional fighter. And with Vlatislav Borshev, nobody wants to stand with this guy. And Mike Davis actually might do it. But I think his volume and his output, his speed will eventually just take over at the end of the day. So I got Davis Davis by decision. I mean, Davis's wrestling has been pretty solid in a bunch of his UFC fights. Two takedowns against Thomas Gifford, uh, three takedowns against Mason Jones. If you're in Davis's camp and you watch Slava Borshev's last fight against D1 Diakasi, yeah, where he gets 11 bad. takedowns and just gets him down there at will, holds him there, it's just like, you'd be silly. You know, Borshev is, what, one of the kickboxing coaches over at Team Alpha Male. It's just like, you'd be silly to go into that fight and not mix in the wrestling. Like, this is mixed martial arts. It's not a kickback, kickboxing match. I'm with you. I think Davis's wrestling is underrated. The, the red flags are more around the fact that he, he hasn't really fought all that much. Obviously, he's been very, very inactive. But I think all the way around, he's a better fighter. Um, competitive uh, in stretches, I think this fight will be. If it's just taking place on the feet in general, like it may look more like a 50 50 spot, but like, I mean, if you're out there and you're listening to this program, Davis's uh, corner, do us a solid and uh, let's get this fight to the mat early and often. Um, on prize picks, it's set to like two and a half takedowns. Like, that's a lot. That's a lot, uh, even for Davis. Like he could get to three. I don't really expect him to put up like a D one Dia Casey. I didn't expect Dia Casey to put up eleven though. In fairness, um, I think they're you know Prize Picks is more setting that line for two and a half takedowns here for the fact that Borshev went out there and got taken down eleven times against Dia Casey. I think they had that set at like two takedowns in that matchup, which was you know we were we were we had already won it in the first round, which was tremendous but yeah i'm with you as well i like mike davis to get the w it, it, what? straight up dude if you watch if you watch other borshev fights he's always getting taken down that's the thing like yeah. on the regional scene he routinely gets taken down he fought on the contender series that first time against chris duncan and gave up two takedowns despite the dude being rocked and not being known for his wrestling he, he gave up two and then dakota bush dakota bush can wrestle He's just not like an elite level martial artist. Gives up another two takedowns there. And then Dia Casey just puts the hustle on him. So uh, the two and a half to me looks good simply because Davis just has to mix in a takedown in all three rounds, which I think he will. And Borshev always gets up, right? Always gets up. It's whether he gets up and gets dumped back to the ground is no good for him, right? So Davis a little more well-rounded as a mixed martial artist, I'm hoping. And uh, yeah, gets the job done. Sounds like you're on the same page. You've got a decision as well. Uh, yeah, that sounds about right to me. Okay. All right, moving on down. We've got, I mean, the fight that I'm hoping gets canceled again so that my heart doesn't need to be broken. We got Lear, <laughs> the sledgehammer Latifi taking on Alexi Olenek, and I still feel attacked, Cody. Two dudes that have been Team Paul Shag guys. That's a capital G, guys. Four years going at it and it's uh, my my analysis of this doesn't really change you can't sub, you can't choke someone who doesn't have a neck alir latifi doesn't have a neck he's going to take him down he's going to lie on top of him it's going to be ugly it's going to be slow paced but as long as he survives the first six, seven minutes in this fight then he'll just be able to lie on top of him without like any sort of like threat or, or risk of injury I think Latifi wins minus 180 is a little bit dicey like if it's on the feet I think this is very competitive maybe Olenek is able to use some like reach advantage obviously uh in this spot Latifi hits like a you know he's built like a fire hydrant he hits really really hard um when he does but he throws next to no strikes like his game plan is go in there and lay and pray uh, rinse repeat and that's kind of what he does in most of his fights I'm picking the sledgehammer 
I'm not going to be betting this fight because, you know, my heart's too invested on both sides. But uh, I hope both both guys come out uh, unscathed, uninjured, and uh, ready to roll against some, some clown so I can bet them again. Yeah, this one's interesting because, like, the last time I got booked, I'm all in on the Latifi. Like, how does he lose this fight? Alex- Alexa Olenek, for as dangerous as he is, he's been getting by on scoring the freaking takedown, man. He's taking guys down, and once he gets on top of dudes, he's still got that old-timey jiu-jitsu game to him, right? And, of course, he fights rather low-level guys, so he's able to still pull them out. But against Ilya Latifi, he's not taking him down. Okay, now we got a striking battle. Well, what's he going to do in a striking battle? Yes, he's got the output. Yes. He could let his hands go and maybe play a bit of a range game. But against Irlu Latifi, if he gets hit with any one of those shots, he's going down. We've seen Alexei Olenek, he potentially has a, a, a compromised chin. And for as much as Irlu Latifi is not really a heavyweight, dude's uh, best days were at 205. He's a little bit older now. He hasn't had a big knockout win in, you know, a little bit. When you do look at the resume, bad guys. But the Chris Dempsey fight, two minutes, seven seconds into the first round. Knocks out Hans Stringer, 56 seconds into the first round. Sean O'Connell, who won a million dollars. And then became the the PFL uh, broadcaster, knocks him out in thirty seconds flat. Uh, he's got that big winging power with those big hooks that generally doesn't work against anybody that's considered top ten or top fifteen and agile. But against Olo- o- Alexa Olenek, he'll be there to hit. So I could see him just toppling over o- Olenek with a big overhand right, big overhand left in the early stages of, of this thing, or maybe just take him down and ground and pound him out of there. But yeah, if not, it's going to be a bog. And the way he's been fighting at heavyweight, that's what it is. The Derek Lewis fight, he landed five significant strikes over the course of 15 minutes. The Tanner Bowser fight, he actually doubled his output in that fight, landing 10 significant strikes over the course of 15 minutes for a total of 15 significant strikes landed in his last two fights, both of which were 15 minutes. So in the last half hour, he's landed 15 significant strikes. Got what, what the hell? But at the same time, a lot of people debated that he should have beaten Derek Lewis. I didn't, but some people did. And then he actually did beat Tanner Bowser by not landing anything, but by being on top. So is his jiu-jitsu game good enough that he can kind of deal with everything a Linux going to throw up from the bottom? Yeah, I think so. does got a neck, like you said. So what are the chances a Linux going to hit him with an Ezekiel off his back or something old-timey and tricky like he used to do? Probably not overly high. If he goes for something like that, he's going to get ground and pounded. And of course, if he gets ground and pounded, he's going to get knocked out. It all leans towards your Latifi getting the job done. I just don't know if I want to chase the dragon and go with that Ilu Latifi by knockout, like that plus 195, plus 200 range, or is he just going to lie on top of him and you can score a Latifi by decision at 250? My heart tells me the knockout. I think I think against Bozer, Bozer is pretty freaking durable, right? He's a mm-hmm. durable heavyweight. And in his last fight against Derek Lewis, like Lewis has got durability issues against the best guys in the world, right? So, yeah, it's tough to put them away against Olenek. I think he could do it. So, last but not least, I know you're a Kamzat Chimaev fan. And, like, Latifi's getting some work in. You know what I mean? They've been in Las Vegas. They were at All-Stars in Sweden. I think he's in good shape. I think he's hungry and motivated. This is a very favorable matchup for him. So, I just got to make sure he's healthy. Because I believed all of this stuff before his last scheduled fight. And he was the one that pulled out with health issues, right? So something there's a little bit suspect, uh, suspicious to me, but I just think stylistically he gets this job done. Even if it's a knockout or a boring decision, regardless, I still just think he gets the job done. Yeah. yeah I just hope no one gets hurt. I love both of these guys. <laughs> Fair enough. Fair enough. Lo- love both of them. Um, I-, I think, I honestly, I kind of think that like the best way to approach this fight, you know, throwing all of my biases aside, I think the best way to approach this fight is to... Make sure, you know, make sure Alir doesn't die in the first round. Doesn't somehow, I mean, he doesn't have a neck. So how is he even going to get choked? But like, I could see Olenek having some early success here. You get a much better price than the minus 180. But you also see like Latifi's able to take him down when he wants to. I'll, I'll be watching live, maybe hopping in live. Latifi is the pick on the show. But, uh, you know, I just hope. Both guys, uh, you know, are cleared for action as soon as possible against somebody else. Moving on down, we've got Tab- Tabitha Ricci taking on Jessica Panay. Minus 205 Ricci, plus 175 Panay. Uh, I think there's actually, I, I know, you know, Pat Mayo's not in the room. And, you know, Pat usually like, you know, he's, oh, it's a, it's a dogger pass on the women's fights every single time. It's like, I don't know. Tabitha Ricci was able to take down... 
Uh, you know, in her last fight, five takedowns against Pollyanna Vienna, who has like a sick, sick guard off of her back. Able to kind of take her down at will whenever she wanted to. She trains, obviously, with Mackenzie Dern. So it's like, what is she? Is she she's not going to not be ready for anything that Penne has off of her back. If it's on the feet, I think both of them are pretty rudimentary in their skills. But, like, I don't really expect Ricci to struggle all that much to take Penne down. And I think when she takes her down, she's going to take her down multiple times and take her down at will, basically. So... Um, and when she's in her guard, it's probably not going to be enough coming back from Jessica Penne to, to pull anything off. So I think Tavarici is actually a decent little parlay piece. I parlayed her with the shyness versus Yusuf fight doesn't go to decision. And, uh, that came out at plus 118. Um, cause yeah, I'm, I did that and I did Mike Davis. So I'm very heavily invested in somebody dying in the uh shyness versus use of fight and then yeah Ricci and uh and Sadiq I didn't make a three banger of those just you know split it up uh split it up two ways but yeah I think Ricci absolutely rolls here she has all the skills to win a very very dominant decision so Tabitha Ricci for me what about you yeah, I got Tabitha Ricci as well. And then, uh, again, trying to chase some additional value because I don't like the minus 220 on the money line uh, considering how much experience she's giving up. And the fact that if we got a lot of grappling exchanges, you know, that does actually play into Jessica Panay's wheelhouse. But Tabitha Ricci by decision minus 150 to me makes a whole lot of sense because Jessica Panay is not getting submitted. She's got excellent jiu-jitsu. Um, but in terms of how has she been knocked out before, a couple times by like the world's elite strikers. So I don't think she's got a chin issue. I don't think she's got a submission defense issue. I don't think she's going to get finished in the spot. It's that she's physically getting controlled by a lot of these younger, stronger, hungrier fighters. And even though she was able to pull off, you know, a sloppy mess over against Lupita Godinez and get the decision victory there um, in a questionable fight, like she took the back, but outside of that got taken down, got outstruck. The Carolina Kovalkiewicz fight, she gave up the takedown and then Kovalkiewicz fell into the submission and then her last fight against Emily Ducote, she just kind of got sprawled and brawled, but did take a little bit of damage in that fight, got kind of beat up standing. So since she's come back, I haven't really seen one performance that it's like, wow, Jessica Panay really is making those improvements, really can compete at that higher level. Uh, I'm just not quite seeing it. Ricci, like you mentioned, two fights back. Well, her debut against Mino Fioro, like, oh man, who takes that kind of short notice debut up like against one of the division's best at 125 pounds? It's tough, right? She's only five foot one, so at 115 pounds, it's definitely where she's going to be strongest and most equipped. But both of those last fights, Maria Oliveira and Pollyanna Vienna, five takedowns in both of them, especially the Vienna fight, because Vienna is technically BJJ black belt. Some people worried about maybe a potential armbar from guard or situation arising. She just took her down at will and then looked pretty good on top. Mm -hmm. Against Maria Oliveira, I thought she looked really good in the, the early going and then fatigued the longer it went. But against Pollyanna Vienna, cardio looked better. This girl's young. She's got great jiu-jitsu. The wrestling is definitely coming into play. And so I think that, yeah, she's going to be able to take down Panay, control her. I think it's going to be closer than the line suggests, the money line anyways. I think Pat could be on to something by just saying spam the underdog bet, considering he's getting a lot of experience. And again, Panay is going to be good in grappling exchanges, so could make something happen. But uh, yeah, yeah, I, I got to go with that minus 150. Um for for the BB Shark to get the job done, Tabitha Ricci by decision minus one fifty. Minus one fifty is the. I mean, there's there's better prices out there right now than that. I see it yeah, available well, yes, at yeah. minus one ten, minus one fifteen, minus one fifty. I feel like is probably okay. where the, is probably where this should be should be priced. That that's the sharp book that I usually kind of judge other books lines off of, Cody. The one that oh, you're looking yeah. at. There right. you go. There you go. All right. All right, moving on. We've got uh, Joaquin Silva taking on Jesse Ronson. Joaquin Silva is a minus 140 favorite. Jesse Ronson can be had. Four plus 120. Who you got here, Cody? Are we fading Canada? Ah, uh, man. Yeah, like part of me is like, dog, you got to take an underdog at some point. Jesse Ronson could make it happen. The other part of me is like the narrative part of me where it's like, man, Jesse Ronson, maybe he's nearing retirement. He's 36 years old. He's had some really tough weight cuts in the past. He went 0-3 in the UFC his first time around. Got cut. Busted his ass to get back to the UFC. Won a big fight over Nicholas Dalby and looked damn good doing it. 
pops for roids, two year suspension, comes back, and then the Rafa Garcia fight it, like started off okay, stuffed some early takedowns, got back up to his feet, you know, landed a little bit, but the continuous pressure from Rafa Garcia, he looked super uncomfortable fighting off his back foot. An illegal knee does stun him in the second round. You can make an argument that maybe it hurt him way worse. He was vocal on social media afterwards that he doesn't really remember much past the illegal knee, but he agreed to continue because that's what fighters do. In the second where they were like, can you fight? He said, yeah. They said, do you need the five minutes? He said, no. Did that compromise him? I don't know. But you can just see from his body language, his energy levels are depleting very quickly. He's all of a sudden not that comfortable. His punches are not coming as frequent. His punches don't have as much zap on them. He does not get Rafa Garcia's uh, attention or respect. And then Garcia just bulls him over and submits him in the second round. So to me, as a guy that's followed Jesse Ronson's career for a long time, that was a very bad version of him. Now, keep in mind, that's the version of him on a two-year-long layoff coming back. He knows kind of if I lose this fight against Joaquim Silva, good chance that the UFC is going to release me again. And if the UFC releases me again, at my age and the amount of fights that he's had professionally, 32 professional fights under his belt, is plus kickboxing matches and stuff, is it worth it to continue on? And, you know, I know you and I always discuss, like, when a fighter, he hasn't announced he's retiring after this fight by no means, but when a fighter is thinking about it, when they're, when they're kind of thinking, while well, I'm in the twilight, like, he's kind of been adamant, this is my fight to go out i have to perform if i don't perform the writing's on the wall for me and i think just admitting that as a fighter is a very difficult task that coupled with his last performance against rafa garcia it's got me worried because the thing with joaquin silva is one he's got excellent jiu-jitsu so if this fight hits the ground there's an there's a really good chance that he might be able to submit um, jesse ronson the same way rafa garcia did but also he's a banger like he's more of a brawler and that's why i think ronson could intercept him and maybe hurt him but he's coming forward he's landing big shots He's been in there with, you know, good level of competition. I do think he's a little bit chinny, and I think a good counterpuncher like Ronson could definitely knock him out. And that's kind of one of the reasons I'm leaning towards taking that plus money dog shot on Ronson. I think he's bigger than this guy. He's a better striker than this guy. It's that if Ronson from two years ago is taking this fight, I'm playing this plus money. If Ronson from 2022 going on 2023 is taking this fight, and, and I can only judge it based on that last performance because, of course, in life but in sport you're only really as good as your last fight he didn't look good man now was that the illegal knee maybe was that the two-year long layoff maybe if you check jesse ronson online right now he looks in career best shape he looks shredded he's hungry he's ready to go but it's that hungry thing everybody's hungry everybody wants it like how much do you want it are you willing to do the things that other guys aren't and maybe joaquin silva is the same way he's on two fight losing streak he's coming off a 37 second knockout loss like this is live for ronson underdog money because they're both it's a it's a fight of circumstance ronson looked awful his last fight joaquin silva's looked awful his last fight you know who do you take i'm tempted to take ronson and because i don't have a dog to this point i'm gonna take jesse ronson but uh yeah, it I might be like the PRP pick. It might be like one line above the PRP pick. It might be the PRP pick. That's we'll fair. I think that this fight's super, super volatile. I think the <laughs> the best bet on this fight is the Doesn't under. Doesn't go the distance? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's okay. minus one... F- I mean, there's a minus 120 on the under two and a half available right now. But, like, uh, fight doesn't go to decision, minus 145, like... The way both of these... I mean, one guy's name is the body snatcher. Like, come on. How does he? How does it not go to? Or how is it not finished? I mean, both of them. It's just like they're kind of kill or be killed kind of guys. Like at least uh, in their, you know, in their their UFC runs, like you go through what Bronson's been up to: rear naked choke loss to Rafa Garcia, rear naked choke win against Dalby, rear naked choke uh, win against Troy Lampson, Alexation round one, like. Just so many finishes. Same with Silva. It's just like super, super chinny. Not sure is gra- maybe he'll have a slight grappling advantage here, but I don't really love a side for you know the purposes of making a, a flat out pick. I'll fade Canada. I'll I'll take Joaquin Silva. But Did I throw one more wrench in the mix. But I think the best the, the best Silva? bet is fight doesn't go to decision by far on this fight. Yeah, yeah. So okay, this this is this is why I'm gonna lock in that Ronson pick and give myself some faith. Okay. So with Joachim Silva, of course, it's like, oh dude, his last two fights he got knocked out. But yeah, man, Ricky Glenn is badass. And 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 Nazarat Hakparas, he's a badass. Okay. Nazrat, okay. oh come on. 
Well, that's, I just that's mean not it's not. Bad. It's not. No, they're not. Maybe they're not badass, but it's not. It's not a bad competition. It's not no. bad competition. It's not Here's bad. the thing with Rick Glenn. Okay, this is Rick Glenn's UFC career. Ba -da -ba -ba -ba. He makes the UFC coming off a split decision win. He fights Dunham decision. Felipe Nova decision. Gavin Tucker decision. That should have been stopped, but it was a decision. Miles Jerry uh, decision. Dennis Bermudez decision. Kevin Aguilar decision. He knocks out Joaquim Silva in 37 seconds. Mm -hmm. And then his next and then his next fight against Grant Dawson, no surprise, was a decision. The guy's had 10 fights in the UFC. He only knocked out one guy one time ever. 37 seconds was Joaquim Silva. Damn. Well, what about Nazareth Hackcross? Well, damn, once you know this. Debuts against Marcin Held, decision. D. Casey, decision. Uh, Tebow Gowdy, decision. Knocks out Joaquim Silva 36, 36 seconds into the second round. And then the Munoz fight decision, Rafa Garcia decision, Dan Hooker, Bobby Green, John McDessey, both of those guys have only ever knocked out one guy in 10 plus UFC fights. They yeah. have like a combined 23 UFC fights. They have one thing in common. They both knocked out Joaquin Silva. He can't take a punch. So how could you play him as the favorite against anybody? I'm not playing him. I'm no, not I know you're him. not, but but I feel better about my, I've talked myself into it, baby. Let's go. And, and, and Ronson, he knows if he goes out there and knocks the guy out and gets 50 Gs, that changes everything. We're back in it. So, uh, yeah, taking it seriously. He looks in good shape. Check him out online. Looks in really good shape. Uh, they all look. Roll, I mean, I, I, I'm looking at Joaquin Silva's topology page right now. The guy looks like he's, <laughs> he's in trouble. Yeah. He, he looks pretty he jacked. Looked good. He just choked out Neil Magny on, like, that Fury FC grappling match. And, like, he looked really good, to be honest with you. He looked really good. But uh, they say in a grappling match, this is MMA. And there's a reason why he's doing jujitsu. There's a reason why he hasn't taken an MMA fight. Because he doesn't he's have a chance. in that fire. You should. Yeah, oh yeah. wow, yeah. You should look at his Instagram. He's, he's uh, ripped. He's he looks like, you know, he looks like. Yeah, what, pick. He looks like you know maybe maybe he should be avoiding some of the, uh, you know, the people who came after Ronson. Just uh, just hide from them <laughs> for a little bit because he's looking he's looking gacked up. Um, but you know it that's Instagram. Everyone looks their best on Instagram. It's a total farce. You wouldn't post it if it wasn't a good picture. Of course not. Of course not. Um, so yeah, Silva for you uh, for me, Ronson for you. I'm not really confident at all. Didn't sound like you were very confident, but it sounded like you were a little bit more confident than me. We both like fight doesn't go to decision. I think that's a super super sharp play. Um, Nah, both of these guys should be in a kill or be killed type of mentality. And they're both basically fighting for their job, which sometimes people are like, oh, you know, they'll fight. Uh, I don't think so. I think like these guys are going to get after it, try to close the show, try to save them, save their job with the UFC. Cause like what they signed 43 people off of contender series, Cody. It's like, you know, those roster cuts are coming. Like they are coming and they are coming fierce. They are coming before Christmas time um, because they got to make room for all these uh, these new people on 12 and 12 contracts. Moving on down, we got uh, Christoph Jotko taking on Brendan Allen. Jotko is a minus 135 favorite. Allen can be had for plus 115. Who you got here, buddy? Yeah, so I know it's probably greasy, but like I'm going to take another underdog. What, what? Uh, does it count what? as an underdog? Not really. I mean, it's pretty much a yeah, pick it's an and underdog. fight. Did the line flip? Was no, it? No, was no, it, it's an underdog. I mean, it's okay. it's people like it. Seems like when I look at like the entire market right now, it's like people like themselves both sides of this. Um, you know, and I think there are good arguments for both sides of the uh, of the spectrum here. I think there's good arguments on both sides of the spectrum. The thing is, is like I keep telling myself it is MMA, and at some point the judges are going to say we want more action mm -hmm. as opposed to grinding guys against the cage. And there was a little spurt there where you saw a whole lot of control happening and then the other fighter getting awarded the fight because you're not doing anything with the control. That's what's going to bite uh, Jocko in the ass. It's like it's a whole lot of him controlling his opponent, scoring a couple takedowns here and there, holding them up. But not a whole lot of submission attempt, not a whole lot of passing guard, not a whole lot of significant strikes landed. I will give him one thing. He does an excellent job of closing that distance, getting a hold of his opponents, and forcing the clinch on them. His cardio is good enough that he can continuously force a clinch on you for 15 full minutes. Brandon Allen's got a knack for getting tired, especially in like these grinding-type fights. So like I could see him getting tired, getting fatigued up against the cage, giving up takedowns. 
I also do see a whole lot of improvements in him. He spent time in South Florida. He spent time in Las Vegas. He trains at an elite level. Kid's still young, Brandon Allen is, and I think he's just getting better in there. He's got big wins in his career. It's whether or not he ties him in in that specific fight. The, his last two losses, Sean Strickland, Chris Curtis. Again, I can give him passes in both of those. And then the since then... But the, the Jacob Malkoon fight, interesting, because he completely gasses. He completely gasses and he gives up the takedowns. But that was one of those fights, again, where Jacob Malkoon got the control, okay, but doesn't do anything, just clings on to him. I know. I think that's why the judges gave it to him. And to me, it was I, close. I, kind of I, had, I, had a, I had a Malkoon by decision plus 800 ticket, which was. I was a little I, bit salty, but like it was, it's right. one of those situations, like it was such a close decision. It's like you didn't feel bad losing it. You would prefer to win, but it's like I didn't. I I was actually kind of just kidding when I said he should have. I thought it was close enough that you could make the debate, and that's why I see a lot on like Twitter is like people going like, "Oh, this guy got robbed." This was like you know definitive, definitive. It's just like yeah, there's usually like pretty. There's just fights that are sometimes just super, super close. You'd be like, you don't remember exactly every single little sequence that happened in round two, which was like seven, eight minutes ago. It's like. Yeah, it's, it's kind of crazy when people go, like, absolutely insane. I was saddened to lose that Malcoon by decision because, like, his money line was, like, plus 200, and his by decision was plus 800, and it was just like, this guy can't finish a sandwich. Um, yeah. It was close well, enough yeah. that, like, I didn't feel robbed, but it was the one that got away. Sorry, well, I, I, mean, I, I absolutely cut you off, and then I just cut you off again, and then the fans in the comments section get mad at me. I even get, like, tweets about it, Cody. That I cut you off all the time. It's my show. I'm going to cut off people when I want to cut them off. No disrespect. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Malcoon had seven minutes of top control in that fight, so I get it. But, like, I watched a live local fight the, the well, was last weekend, and Buddy gives up a takedown, okay? Well, as he's getting taken down, he elbows in the face three or four good shots in the face. Then he gets taken down. As soon as he hits his back, he starts smashing this guy with elbows in the face. This other guy, not doing anything. Lying on top of him. I ended up watching the fight back, right? Counted it up. And it was like he got out struck 39 to 2. And it was a 30 27 across the board for the guy on top because of the takedowns and the top control. So I was like, is that a broken system that one guy elbowed you in the face 39 times? You've got noticeable swelling around your face and he looked completely fine. But because of the multiple takedown attempts and the 10 minutes of top control, they just automatically give the fight to you. Like, it's a fight. It's not a wrestling match. It's not a wrestling match. You got to try to finish. You got to try to get after it. Allen, to me, in that Malcoon fight in the first round, he had struck him like 18 to 12, but 15 to 12, I think, but he gets taken down. Fair. The second round is 12 to 12, and he also does get taken down a pile of times as well. So it's fair. But you can tell the entire time he's elbowing. You can tell the entire time he's trying to get on top. You can tell the entire time he's trying to, to break away. He gets taken down seven times on 14 attempts. And then in the third round, I feel like that was the best his cardio had looked. They're both tired, but it was him pushing through, outstruck him, won that third round, showed that he wanted to win the fight, showed that he wanted to finish the fight, showed that he was there to physically fight, and they awarded him for that. And you can't discredit that. So I'm hoping, again, he's young. That's a great takeaway. You come into this spot. One thing with Jacob Malkoon is you can say he can't finish a sandwich and this and that. He, he can't. The guy doesn't finish anything. But straight up, man, he got eight takedowns against Abdul Razak Al-Hassan, who's a big-time judo black belt. He got six takedowns over A.J. Dobson, who's like a physical specimen, very, very physically strong. He got seven takedowns over Brandon Out. The guy's a takedown specialist. Mm -hmm. He gets takedowns. I can't, you know, confidently say that Christoph Jocko, a guy that rocks a couple takedowns, I know he's coming off his last fight, you know, whatever. He got four in there. But traditionally, he's more of a hold you up against the cage than to continuously take you down, so... To be honest, you're right, though. It's going to be a lot of Jocko holding him up against the cage and Allen trying to stuff takedowns and create space, and it's going to be greasy, and it's going to be tight, and it's going to be close, and I guess that's why the line's set where it is. But, like, yeah, again, I'm just going to take that ever-so-slight dog spot maybe and take me some Brandon Allen by decision. Yeah, I'll, I'll lean towards Allen as well, um, mostly just because, yeah, I think it is 50-50. Slight lean to the underdog in this spot. And I think if all things are equal and they're on the feet, I can see Allen winning as long as he's not getting taken down. I don't think Jocko's like takedown and, and, and pressure and control from top is very good. Um, a lot of cage control potentially, but I don't know if he's going to be able to 
really muscle Allen around like that. But it's like at range, I feel like uh, Brendan Allen should throw a little bit more volume. Not much more volume, but just a little bit, just to get him over that edge. I think it's a super, super close fight. Not one I think I have too much of an edge on whatsoever. Moving on down, we got Maxime Grishin taking on Felipe Linz. Minus 180 Grishin, plus 155 for Linz. Who do you like here, buddy? Yeah, yeah. Another one that's probably going to be greasier than you'd like it to be. But I got to go with Maxim Grishin just being the better kickboxer. The thing with Linz, and this is a guy that I've just never been high up on, is that he actually won a million dollars in the PFL tournament as a heavyweight. Not a big heavyweight, but he beat big guys. K.O. Alencar is huge. Jared Rochal is huge. Josh Copeland, pretty freaking big. Uh, and then just has had no success in the UFC as a heavyweight. Lost to Andre Arlovsky in just a very dull, lackluster affair. Close, greasy fight, sure, but you know, coming off a million dollar win, coming off a little bit of hype, should have maybe done a little bit more. And then the Tanner Bozer fight, he got sparked and looked maybe career worse. From there on, it's like a big long layoff, a gap in time, and then he decides to drop down to two hundred and five pounds. So I know he's still young enough to, or sorry, he's thirty seven years old and he's dropping back from heavyweight down to light heavyweight, which would be his natural weight class. But in the Marcin Prakniau fight, in the first round, he looked awful. He got lit up by Prakniau. Prakniau beat him, I think, 30 to 17 on the striking stats, but just doubles him up faster. Has him in a little bit of trouble in a few spots. And then Prakniau kind of tires. Linz gets his wrestling game going. He's able to rely on that here. Against Maxim Grishin, I don't know if he's going to be able to just rely on that. He's got better, maybe some better hand speed. Maybe he's got better overall agility than Grishin, who's a little bit plodding. But I think Grishin's got decent power. He's got decent kickboxing credentials. And he's done a pretty good job of like getting back up to his feet when need be. He's not a guy that I was very high up on the regional scene. I didn't think he would do all that well coming into the UFC. And outside of making a short notice debut at heavyweight against Marcin Tybora, I can't fault him. The anti-Gulov fight is one of the worst fights I've ever seen in my life. But he does get the second round knockout, thank God, because what a sweat that ended up being. The Dustin Jacoby fight is tooth and nail. He gives an excellent account of himself, and there's this very strong argument he should have won that Jacoby fight. And then, of course, in the William Knight fight his last time out, I think you're just seeing an overall you know, uh, comfort to him, being that he's a, a savvy veteran. He's a little bit older himself, but I think in one guy's 36, 30, they're both about 37, that range. Uh, I, I don't know that, that anybody's got one big clear edge over the other guy. I just feel like I've been more uh, more impressed with what I've seen with Christian lately, as opposed to Linz, who's looked terrible as a heavyweight in the UFC, looked awful in the first round against Prachnia. And the thing with Prachnia is if you're going to beat him, you tend to knock him out. Like He's mm-hmm. not known for his durability by any means. So Felipe Linz at 37 is not carrying over any power with him down to 205. If he doesn't sting Grisham and get his respect, I think he's just going to fall behind on the numbers. So give me Grisham by decision. Yeah, I had I had some uh, some money on Linz like Linz by knockout against uh, Pracknell, and it was very very frustrating. Just like I kind of thought, you know, heavyweight coming down to two oh five, you know, he should be able to like absolutely go out there and and, and kill him, and uh, that did not happen. I mean, go uh, Grecian even the, even the loss to just Dustin Jacoby like. That was a fight that he very, very clear. Like, I thought, like, most people agree, too. It's like Grecian probably won that fight against, like, an accredited kickboxer in Dustin Jacoby. So, um, yeah, I'm with you. I think uh, Grecian makes a lot of sense as, like, a little little parlay piece. Or if you don't do parlays, minus 180 on Maxine Grecian doesn't seem too far off, to be perfectly honest. We got Julia Stoliorenko taking on Chelsea Chandler. Stoli Renko, minus 115 favorite. Ch- Chandler can be had for minus 105. Cody, why don't we like why don't we just play Stoli Renko submission plus 300 and be done We're with this bust. fight? Is that right. like right? Like the money line, it seems like armbar from guard is like her wheelhouse. That's what she does the best. That's when she gets the vast majority of her wins. The disparity between minus 115 on that and plus 300 on her to win by submission. It's like, I really don't see too many other paths to victory for her. Um, definitely. And I want to see what like other books when they open up their props for this, if I can get a little bit greasy and, and, and find a way to attack this. But uh, Stinko Sub is, uh, is, is my plan of attack on this fight. What about you? 
Yeah, I have no idea how to attack this one, man, because Stenko is like showing that she's not even all that bad. Like, no, I like know. in some in That's some why I actually I, I said her spots. actual I said her actual name at the beginning. Um because that was Stenko was the nickname that we had given her for all these, but like she's actually showed that like she's grown out of that nickname. So, you know, I I'm still I'm still learning to call her Stoliarenko. But, uh, you know, we've made some serious progress here. And I'm considering betting her, which is mind-blowing for me. You, if you told me that like a year and a half ago, I would have called you crazy. Yeah, like is, there's spots throughout her career. This girl's gone over and fought in left way. You know, all of her wins being by armbar. Like she's got that judo. She's got that ability to snag up your armbar. They call her Lithuanian Ronda Rousey, which you know I wouldn't agree with personally. But all the same, it's just she's got all these armbar wins, right? But she can strike. She can take a hell of a punch. And then she likes getting into these scrappy type affairs. She, uh, was on the Ultimate Fighter, eh, work in progress, you know. Again, when and fought over in uh, in Burma, Myanmar, um, bare knuckle boxing, got some experience, came back to the UFC, and that Yannick Kunikea fight and the Julia Avila fight, very, very bad. But the Alexis Davis fight was like the turning point. Where it's like, even though she's getting dominated when she ends up on her back because she can't armbar Davis, she snags up Davis in quite a few armbars. Now, for the record, Alexis Davis has very slick jiu-jitsu, BJJ black belt, and it's a problem when she's on top of you, and yet Storley Ranko did a good job. When the fight was standing, Storyline goes way faster, beat her the punch, landed some good damage, probably won the second round, you know, made that fight way closer than it need be. It was a good learning experience, I think, for her. And then the Jesse Jess Rose Clark fight, she just snags an armbar right off the hop, you see that she's dangerous with that move. That is very clearly her move. She can grab it on. I wouldn't say anybody, but almost getting Alexis Davis with that, that's actually a, would mm -hmm. have been a massive feather in her cap. And then to hit Jesse Jess Rose Clark in 42 seconds, Rose Clark just got armbarred by Stephanie Egger. Sure to God, she has spent her entire camp working on exact same position against Story Lenko and nope. still got her arm busted like very, very quickly. So... Yeah, I think she's very dangerous. And the thing with Chelsea Chandler is that she doesn't look bad. She's a, you know, Caesar Gracie girl. Uh, she's bigger than Story Olenko, and clearly she's got a little bit of jiu-jitsu of her own. So it's very possible that she's going to be able to just take her down, stay on top, stay out of harm's way. But it's the opponent difference, right? She hasn't really fought anybody at this level. She hasn't fought anybody that strong. She hasn't felt the bright light. She hasn't felt the pressure. If she doesn't get takedowns and she's forced to stand with her, again, probably has cleaner technique. Is she going to be able to physically go hard with her for a prolonged period of time? It's all questions. The the thing that's got me saying I don't really want to bet Storyolenko straight up, like you said, by submission 350, she's going to win probably like that, is that Chelsea Chandler's a 45er, right? And apparently she was going to come in and fight Leah Letson at about 145. Yeah, and this Leah is Letson pulls out. Julia Storyolenko says, well, I'll fight her, but I'm a 35er. So they're meeting at 140. And Story Lenko, I don't like people that are so one dimensional focused on one move that when they don't get it, they just keep going. Like Davis, yeah, she almost got her. But the second time and the third time and the fourth time, it was always less than that first initial attempt. So Fair. I'm I'm a little bit worried that maybe Chelsea Chandler is able to prolong this thing and to do some work from on top. But Again, I, I'm going to be like, I'm taking another underdog, but I'm not. I'm not. It's a straight up even money fight. The line is just like not fully agreeing with it. Is it Chandler's technically the slight underdog right now or is she the favorite? Uh, I mean, I'm going to go with Julia is what I'm going to do. Where you're going to go with Julia. Is Julia's the favorite time. by, like I mean, it's a, Cody, it's, it's, a, it's a pick them. This doesn't count as an underdog. Yeah. Let's see what we see at the weigh-ins. Is it that much of a size discrepancy? Because that's kind of my one major yeah. concern. I mean, I'm that, waiting. You know, she knows how to grapple. She's going to end up on top. I'm waiting for more books to open up submission props. Like, I'm not taking that plus 300 yet. I'm hoping that, uh, you know, better, you know, better opportunities could be available. But we will see. Maybe they won't. Maybe that plus 300 is the best. But it's very rare that when that book opens it up that somebody doesn't give you a better price um you know patience is a virtue sometimes um in the in the mean streets of props uh moving on down and the final oh actually one last thing i wanted to say when, when you were saying under the bright lights no fans cody there's no fans there's no uh there's no media there's uh you know do you have a greasy theory on this? Uh, I, I've heard some people talking about how it's going to be Mark Zuckerberg is going to be in attendance uh, at the UFC Apex for this. 
and they're yeah. they're testing out this uh I don't know it's way beyond my simple brain um they're testing out this virtual reality whatever they're working on in the metaverse I don't know it sounds really nerdy to me but um that Maybe they don't want people around when somebody of, you know, that's that rich. They don't want MMA fans around uh, Mark Zuckerberg, p perhaps. And apparently, uh, Mackenzie Dern is like Zuckerberg's favorite fighter. So, I don't know. That's, that's like what people think is the reason why he's not let, or why Dana's not letting any media or any fans attend this event. Because it is very strange and they're being very secretive. It's very weird. Yeah, you know what? It is very weird because, like, you know, Shaq, you can see him in the in the crowd at an event, and it would be like not out of place. You know, there's other people, but like Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, and you know, Elon Musk, I can see out in a crowd, I suppose. But like, even then, man, I think you get. I'm not saying they're better than anybody because nobody is, but I think you get to a certain level where it's like you don't go hang in 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 public and shit, no. you know. And so, if you wanted to go, they would. Here's a good story for you, right? So my uncle. I only have one uncle. My dad's got one brother, my uncle John, right? He's a criminal defense lawyer in Sudbury, right? So he's flying out for some conference thing. And then just so coincidentally, whatever little plane he's on lands and is waiting for like this hour on this tarmac. And uh, Bill Clinton's private jet lands. He comes off with like two secret, ser uh, secret service agents. And my uncle and like the two other three people that were on his plane were like talking to the agents. They're like, could we get a picture? And they were like, you can get a picture, but you give us the phone. We take the picture and you can't touch him. So my uncle's got like the hover arm going <laughs> and it was his Christmas card that year. He sent it to everybody, but uh, Bill Clinton wouldn't go to a, an event. You know what I'm saying? Like there's, you would have to say, you know what, if you really want to come to a, a, an event, we'll shut down the whole apex and you can basically have it private. And I think that's basically more or less what they're doing. Now, how does that correlate to the bright lights? Well, one, you might get a little bit starstruck where it's like Mark Zuckerberg sitting cage side and they're testing all this fancy equipment. But beyond that, is that as a fighter, you you have to visualize a whole lot, right? When you're visualizing, I'm visualizing my music and then I walk out and I've got fans and a lot of these fighters fight from their own regional scene. So they're used to having friends and family there and you're pumped up and you have your other coaching staff and your teammates and it's a certain feel and all of your pro fights have been the exact same way. You've been building up bigger and better, bigger and better. Now there's nobody cheering. Like Dana's sitting right there. The matchmakers are sitting right there. It's all eyes on you. That's pressure. That's yeah, more pressure sure. than the fans screaming. And it's just like, Oh man, you feed off that energy. This is like uh, you can hear a cricket drop. The the other corner, you can hear them just as clear as day. Sometimes that's more pressure. The being there's nobody there, right? Imagine like fighting in front of all your coworkers and then like the company bosses are there somewhere within the crowd as opposed to fighting right in front of the company bosses. It's only them in the room. So I think, especially for a debuting fighter, it, it's going to be a little bit different. So um, again, Chelsea Chandler seems like she's got some skill, but at four and one, those fighters are prone to make mistakes. And people like Julia Stolyarenko, for as many flaws as she has, she capitalizes on those mistakes. So maybe she's live in that spot. I'll, I'll lean towards her ever so slightly. The plus 350, like you said, on the submission makes the most sense. Maybe wait to see if you can get a better price. Maybe wait to see weigh-ins to see uh, how much of a size discrepancy there really is. But um, I think I'm going to go with uh, Julia. That makes sense. All right, in the final or the first fight of the night, we got Randy Costa taking on Guido Canetti, minus three hundred Costa, plus two fifty Canetti. Here's my struggle with this one, Cody, and you know me. I mean, Guido, like, let's put it all out there. There's a reason why this price is set this way. Guido is forty two year old bantamweight. He's been an underdog in tons of fights. Uh, durability isn't great uh his um you know yeah sorry durability isn't great cardio isn't really tremendous his wins are over the likes of chris mutinho diego rivas hugo viana my struggle with costa and i think costa wins this fight but at minus 300 it's just like i've lost a little bit of faith in this guy that he can fight more than about six seven minutes and the gas completely just falls off of an absolute cliff. I think Costa wins. I guess for the purposes of this show, I'll pick Costa. But I'm kind of interested. And we'll see where the props land as the as the week goes along. Because I've seen as high as like 25 to one um, early on in the week here. But like 
Guido round two KO is like 25 to one, which like I do see, uh, uh, obviously not the most likely outcome, but I do see an outcome where Costa comes out, Kennedy somehow survives, and then Kennedy sends him into another world in round two. Um, you know, Kennedy's dangerous. He throws heavy, heavy kicks to the body. If Costa falls apart in round two, I, I, I do give the slight cardio advantage to the 42-year-old. It's not pretty, but I, I can see a path where, yeah, where Costa, you know, like like he's want to do is like he, he blows his absolute wad early on in this fight and then and Kennedy catches him a little bit uh, into round two. So l I'm interested in really, really long, greasy, crazy props on Guido Kennedy. Costa, I think, wins. Minus 300 plus 250 seems about right to me in terms of the money line situation. But yeah, Guido props for... Uh, like absolute degeneracy for me in this fight. What about you? Yeah, I think Guido's getting stopped here. So I got the the under. Sure, sure to God, this fight's not going 15 full minutes. I got the under two and a half. Fight doesn't go the distance, and even the under one and a half. I think it's going to be a banger early. Randy Costa knows he's got to get back to his ways. And flip side of that, Guido Canetti's a banger himself. Neither guy has got great cardio. Neither guy wants to go into those later rounds. So I'm expecting to see an early finish. But brother, you are on to something with Guido Canetti. I would not rule him out. I think he's the best straight up value play of the entire card. And you can even further get better value by going by knockout, by first or second round knockout. And he's 100% live. But Randy Costa, I got a curse with him, right? Um, when he debuted in the UFC, I was very critical of it. His wins were 0-4, Stacey Anderson. 0-0, Kenny Lewis. 5-9, Chris Thorne. 0-1, Rob Fuller. And then he's in the UFC. He was 4-0, and and his best guy was 5-9. and nine. The other guys were 0-1, 0-0, and 0-4, respectively. H how did he make it to the UFC? So I told everybody he's going to get killed, going to get killed. Then he lost to Brandon Davis. But he looked good in the first round, better than I thought he would. Then he lost. I, I faded him against Boston Solomon. He KOs Solomon. I faded him against Jeremy Newson. He fazed Jeremy Newson, knocks him out like nothing. I faded him hard against Adrian Yanez. And my God, Paul, in that first round against Yanez, he looked awesome. Yeah, he always you know, looks good in Way round too one. much output. Yeah, way too much output in that first round. But he did an excellent job of throwing the jab straight down the middle, causing Yanez, a guy with good head work, to bob from side to side. And as he would bob to the side, he'd let the high kick go. So it's like he's got excellent striking, comes from a karate background. He's training at Sanford MMA. Guy's getting better. He's young. Whereas he came into the UFC off full four bullshit wins that didn't really do much for him. The losses in the UFC were good for him. He was getting back-to-back -back wins. He gave Yanez a hell of a go. Faded and got finished in the second. But maybe mm -hmm. there's something there. And so for the first time ever, I bet him against Tony Kelly. And it was one of two things that went terribly wrong. Thing number one, it's possible that because everyone like yourself, you mentioned, everyone always says it. He's got bad cardio. He blows his wad in the first round. It's possible that he went into that Tony Kelly fight thinking, I'm going to get off to a slow start, and it just allowed Tony Kelly to just beat the shit out of him. Or number two, he doesn't fight good off his back foot. See, he's used to being the nail. In the regional scene, he's the, he's the hammer. Sorry, not the nail. He's being the hammer. On the regional scene, he's the hammer. Against Boston Salmon, quick knockout. Journey Newsom, quick knockout. Adrian Yanez, he went straight at him. But Brandon Davis, he had gone straight at him. Against Tony Kelly, Tony Kelly was the aggressor. Tony Kelly was backing him up. And he looked awful against Tony Kelly. That's the worst he's looked in any of his fights in the UFC. He got fatigued fast. He landed no strikes. His power, because he's he got great power, this kid, nowhere to be found. It was like it was a step backwards for him. So he's still young. And I bet he's still getting better. And I bet he probably could land one of those nasty high kicks and knock out Guido Canetti. Mm -hmm. The worry is if Guido Canetti is just like... Pfft, this is what I do. I'm a tough Argentinian, 42 years old. I come forward. I get those hands going. The Chris Moutinho fight, what's too interesting to me there is that people were saying Moutinho has legendary durability because of all the shots he took against Sean O'Malley. But Sean O'Malley touches, touch, touch, go, touch, mm -hmm. touch, go. Whereas Guido plants his feet and throws legitimate power. So that's how come he knocked out Chris Moutinho so easily. And Sean, not saying Sean O'Malley's not as good of a striker. It's, it's the power in which he's throwing those strikes. He's being the aggressor. The reason that I think that Costa will get the job done, though, is when you look at Guido in recent times, like 
Moutinho didn't have the firepower, I guess, to hurt him, right? Mana Martinez does hurt him a couple power. times in that. Yeah, does have legit firepower and had hurt him a couple times. You know, Dana Baccarell knocks him out in the first. Marlon Vera, Guido Canetti actually wins the first round against Marlon Vera. And then second round falls apart. So, like, if he's going to get hit, and if Randy Costa goes out there and says, I got to get back to what I used to do, which is just go at these guys for seven minutes. Nah, not even seven minutes, five and a half minutes. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I, I think he might be able to catch him and knock him, knock him out. But in both scenarios, one of these guys is going to either try to kill the other guy or get tired in, do, in doing so and get killed by the other guy. It ain't going the distance. The minus yeah, one, the under one and a half, that one's always a little riskier because sometimes guys take a little bit of time to get settled. But the under two and a half, the fight doesn't go the distance. Those seem like uh, better bets in that money line 300 on, on Randy. Barely available. Um, they got fight doesn't go to decision minus 400. Mm, um, yeah. Under yeah, under so. one and a half rounds is minus 170. I mean, uh, the safer approach than playing like the round two Guido props that I'm playing. Um, obviously, you won't get like as big of a number, but it's like sit back. Watch Randy Costa storm the brigade, absolutely throttle Guido. And if Guido still has a pulse around, you know, the end of round one, you're probably going to get, you're going to get a much better number than the plus 250 um, at that point. And I really don't have, until I see it, I really don't have faith that uh, Costa, if he's fighting at a high pace, has 15 minutes of cardio. And I'm like, you know, he just hasn't proved that to us. And if he... If he comes shot out of a cannon, Guido's going to force him into a, you know, a blood and guts war. If Guido is around after round one, this could be a really great live op live betting opportunity. But because it's like an early UFC or, uh, you know, early on the prelims, sometimes it's like some of the books aren't even running live for it. I, I'm going to end up with uh, Guido round two. And I never do. I usually do like round one or round three props. I never do round two, but it's like, Costa has a history of looking amazing in round one and then falling off an absolute cliff in round two, which is crazy at bantamweight. It's like these guys are 135 pound men. It's like 15 minutes of fighting should be pretty easy, but maybe not, not for all. Um, yeah, Costa, obviously minus 300 favor. He could totally win this fight. I wouldn't be shocked if uh, Guido, Guido pulls, pulls one out on him, uh, you know, survives and then and then kills him a little bit like i give guido even though he has his own cardio issues i give guido the the cardio edge in this fight was costa team uh dr pepper or team uh peanut butter cup oh, Reese's peanut butter cup. that was, was that was so dumb that was I the dumbest I promotion forget. yeah yeah i don't know how he i didn't he i didn't understand that. how like uh, that made me feel so old when kids were on twitter talking about that um, I think uh, Yanez was Team Dr. Pepper, uh, if memory serves correct. Right, right. But, like, they're right. not even the same thing. Like, if it was, like, if it was like Barks Root Beer versus Dr. Pepper, you know, we're talking about <laughs> two different sodas that are kind of, like, cola slash root beer. You know, it, it's in the same, you know, they're brown right. sodas. But it's, like, you can't even compare. I didn't, I that, that thing, I'm, I'm, just, I'm triggered just hearing you talk about this right now to be perfectly honest what's your best what's the best ch candy bar straight up candy bar it's Reese's against what I like Snickers Snickers <laughs> what Snickers oh, is a great man. candy bar what are you talking yeah, about yeah it's okay it's not the greatest candy bar in the whole store uh, like, one you know, wonder bar is delightful candy bar of the wonder bars are pretty good there's nothing wonder better than a good. Twix bar a peanut butter cup comes I can't eat second. that anymore Fix is number one. What? Oh, because the bread. Megan says Kit Kat, Kit Kat for life. That's Another good. thing I can't eat as well. Kit Kat, pretty good too. Not gonna lie. Not gonna lie. Um, yeah, man, I gotta get that little bit of crunch with the chocolate. Would you get it Snickers with the Snickers? It's, it's got, got the peanuts. Creamy nougat. No, it's creamy, creamy nougat and peanuts. Nougat. It's got. It's got. You know what? It's got. Crunch. I don't know if this is an unpopular take, but Mars bar better than Snickers bar. It's the for same sure. thing. It just doesn't sure. have peanuts. <laughs> it's similar. It's similar. No, it's literally the same thing. I don't similar, think you're. Paul. I'm, One's got more caramel. I'm One's dubious. got more. 
I'm mm. dubious of your of your uh, chocolate bar knowledge, to be perfectly honest. If you didn't know that Mars is just Snickers without peanuts, you only eat keto friendly, gluten free. As candy of bars. recently, you're look at look at my body bar. type. Do you think I haven't like <laughs> dominated some uh, some candy in my life, my friend? Come on, <laughs> give your That's head fun. a shake. I mean, when we had, I mean, it was even Halloween this past year. Um, did you go trick or treating? No, I gave out candy, and uh, I bought way too much. It was super, super rainy here, and so I had like a hundred like full size chocolate bars. I had like four kids come by, and yeah, um, my place we get like six kids come by. That's it. So I <laughs> had like candy I had like ninety six chocolate bars for like the and I ate them way too fast. I was eating like three, four a day. Um, <laughs> And then not too long afterwards, I discovered I was celiac. Funny how those things work out. Um, right. Eh? Yeah, horrible, horrible. But yeah, it sounds like we both think Costa wins, but the value is squarely on the 42-year-old Argentinian in, in Canetti. Well, I'll hit you with the PRP right now, but then yeah, I, I will tell that. you who I think still the best value plays. But I, I'm going to go officially with Dern, Brown, Rowney Barcellos, Sodik Youssef, John Castaneda, Mike Davis, Ilir Latifi, Tabitha Ricci, Jesse Ronson, which is my dog number one. I'm pretty deep into the card at this point. Brandon Allen, who's going to be my dog number two. We're going to go with Maxim Grishin. I'm going to go with Julia, who's an even money play. And we're going to go with Randy Costa. So really, I've not given you much dog money. Jesse Ronson's a slight dog. Brandon Allen's a very slight dog. There's nothing really there. I'm mostly lived up on these favorites well i will say if you are a value boy the best value that i see would be yawn in the main event she's definitely got a shot of coming through there's good plus money there paul sees trent is good ronaldo i don't quite see it trevin jones maybe don't quite see it don shane i'm not seeing it daniel will widely cat santos there's value on him i'm not seeing it on borsha or alexei olenek penne maybe but i'm not going with it uh and, and guido canetti right guido canetti is a plus 300 play so between guido maybe widely cat santos uh maybe uh yawn in the main event i think there's some decent plus money ones you could chase but i'm looking at this card as mostly there's 13 fights on it it's pretty stacked pretty stacked in terms of those 13 fights i mean then there's a bellator card so it might be one of those good weekends to just pick and choose the fights that you feel the best about instead of chasing a couple of these plus money plays that are greasy on the bottom end of your tickets. Maybe just play it, you know, a little bit, a little bit tighter, a little bit smarter. So, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm still going to put it the PRP. They're going to have all the plays on them. If anything changes, we'll see from weigh-ins. I am tempted to pull a trigger on like maybe one more of these bigger dogs on the card. But if I can at least keep that apple pie shader you know, on the anything below the third ticket, I'd, I'd be okay with that too. So I just want to figure out what's the most safest, what's the most confident stuff, and that's what we'll tie together. Yeah, the bets that I have right now, I literally made on the show. I've got Yusuf versus, uh, and Shayna's fight doesn't go to decision, parlayed with Tabitha Ricci at plus 118. Uh, Yusuf and Shayna's fight doesn't go to decision, parlayed with Mike Davis at plus 135. Fight or bets that I'm considering, Grandpa T, um, we'll see where that line goes. Um, plus 270 doesn't seem too bad to me, to be perfectly honest. He's just always in close fights, so I want to be holding a plus 270 ticket if that fight goes to decision. Um, Stinko submission, plus 300. Like I feel like that's her main path to victory. I'm interested in Kennedy uh, round two props, maybe even round three. I, I got to figure – we'll see when like more options open up, like what numbers are available to me. Um, Dern by submission, I mean, not really all that interested, but if I was going to better, that's how I would go about it. On Bellator, I mean, I'm, I'm like contractually obligated since he's been on the program and I, he's a team Paul Shag guy, Max Roshkoff, uh, taking on, uh, on Hamill. I mean, I got a bat. I got a back Max. I believe in Max. I think, uh, you know. Onwards and upwards for him. I believe in like the, the the wrestling ability that he has is excellent. This is his big step up. This is his big opportunity, and uh, and I'm pulling for him. And I mean, it's getting close to a pick him right now. It's like minus one fifteen is the best price available out there. I'll probably end up with money on him. Is there anybody really quickly, Cody, that jumps off the page as uh, you know Lockman? Like Belter does crazy things. Where it's like a lot of people would be like, oh, you shouldn't parlay Sumiko Unaba because she's like minus seven, uh, minus 700. It's just like he's taking on someone who's two and five. 
Like UFC would never <laughs> sign like outside of you know Mike Jackson, uh, CM Punk situations. Like they don't sign these people. Like Sumiko should absolutely roll her other opponents that she's already gotten rid. Like to, who she's already beaten have better records than this Nadine Mandiao that they brought in, which is kind of crazy. Uh, is there anybody who jumps off the page to Cody as uh, as a as a nice little play on the belly card? You don't have to go yeah. into full out breakdowns. Well, honestly, just, uh, no, yeah, I won't. And there's 14 fights on there, but just like the stuff that jumps off to me as being potentially good, I think AJ McKee moving up a weight gets most definitely back in the win column against by Carlisle. He's got the wrestling and stuff, everything Carlisle's going to bring forward. Carlisle looked terrible in his Bellator debut. I mean, terrible. One, thank God he submitted him in the third, but like we almost took a big time bath on him. He's not up to AJ's level. AJ will have. You know, more energy at 55. I think he wins. Aaron Pico, of course, I'm a huge Pico guy. Pico may be suspect in the chin department. People will always say that because of those early fights in his career. <clears throat> but Jeremy Kennedy's not knocking him no. out. So I you really wouldn't have to worry about it. Good um, good value play on the card is Enrique Barzola against Juan Archuleta. Barzola's elite. He really is. And his last fight was super high level. And it's always pace and grind. And unfortunately, he runs into a guy named Magomed Magomedov. Oh, bad combination, my friend who's a fellow stud and was able to keep that pace up with him. Juan Archuleta, the guy is fantastic, but in these grappling exchanges, his wrestling turns out to end up being his kryptonite. Against Sergio Pettis, Pettis is out grappling him. Going to be a bad spot against Enrique Barzola. I think he comes through. As you said, Inaba, she's a Beltra fan favorite. They're building her up. This Richard Palencia, I think he wins. I'm avoiding Hamill versus Roshkov. Sorry, Paul. Lance Gibson always is big favorite status, and he doesn't ever really look the part. But again, a guy that's just a very talented, getting better. They're trying to build him up the slow way. And against Dominic Clark, a little bit over the hill. Last fight was in Ontario against Adam Asenza. Dusted like three minutes into the first round. I just don't think he's with it anymore. Lance Gibson should be able to handle him there. Uh, and then that 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 would be like the main things, you know. I wouldn't chase Islam Mamadov simply because Nick Brown's actually pretty dope. This Bobby Seronio, I really like him. He's another one of these guys they're trying to build up. But at 650, this young into his career, maybe not good. But just from the five that I, I, I said that I did like, you're getting a plus 303, right? If you just take the ones that you really like, put them with the two or three UFC plays that you really like, maybe even create a hedge out opportunity that you can it should be a good weekend, so that's what I'm planning on. Did you mention five or six? AJ McKee, Aaron Pico, Enrique Barzola, Sumiko Inaba, and Palencia? Yeah, Richard Palencia. But not Lance Gibson. Well, you know, listen, I, I, I mean, you're going to have everybody. I'm building in stages, right. So, yeah. the, so then you add a Lance Gibson, and it's like, okay, now I'm rocking a plus 376. I'm definitely yeah. putting Bobby Cerrone on at that point, and it's a plus 449, right? Uh, JJ Wilson, like up a weight and ugh, just, man, I don't know. Like he, he's actually really talented, but the bad weight cuts is what's get him. So you should pass on that. Ms. Islam Mamadov, a minus 240. He tends to shit in the apple pie because of his low activity rate. Once the fight does hit the ground, I think you'd want to avoid that. Keone Diggs, I don't know. I'm not really high up on him. Um, Robert Almeida, he's an apple pie shitter. Producio Freite, one, again, you can always hedge out once it got there if you wanted to take the shot on Borix. And I really do like Borix. And in five round, especially, the kid's got good cardio. It just seems like Patricio is one of these guys that's just like a, a little bit notch above the rest of the challengers in the division. So I wouldn't say Borix couldn't win this fight. He's rapidly getting better. Patricio's getting a little more worn and torn as time goes on. I just don't know that their peaks have yet quite collided. So I would take him as well. That gives you a plus 806, and you could hedge out at the end of the night. You know, I think Bellator would be good. Bellator mixed with the UFC, perfect. And then, man, my luck. Doctor says you're having a kid September 20th. So it's like, boom, perfect. All planned out. I specifically <laughs> got the, my wife pregnant at a certain time so that I could get the one weekend of the year where there's no UFC. The other one I got married on. <laughs> so uh, I had it all timed out. And then like, no, kid's not here. September 21st, 22nd, 23rd. That's the 28th. Uh, still no baby. So hopefully by the 30th, I think we're just going to go in and get induced if that's like what it comes down to. But yeah, it's been a lot of like sit and go and, you know, waiting and, and all that. So at least, at the very least, I guess hopefully squeeze in my Bellator on the Friday, maybe get some UFC action in and then have this baby call it a weekend. Decided to come on a busy weekend for me, unfortunately. But I hate to be the bear. I hate to be the, hate to be the... Hopefully cash some ticks. Yeah. 
I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but Bellator's on Saturday, Cody. Oh, no. They're going head-to-head with Mark Zucker. They're going head-to... Yeah, the U- UFC and Bellator are going head-to-head with the birth of your child. So it's I got a, I got a choice here. I can watch Bellator, I can watch UFC, or I can watch the birth of my child. Now, listen, it's an easy choice as far as I'm concerned. This Bellator card looks super entertaining, right? UFC, meh. This is one of the rare weekends where I think the Bellator card actually looks better than the UFC card. Um, but all the same, birth of a kid, you know, tight, tight, tight third, I would say. Um, but you know, I just, you know, I'd probably get killed by my wife and death's never a good thing. I, so yeah. I'll be there for that baby. I'll be there for that baby. I would, all jokes yeah. aside, I'm super pumped up about of it. Course. But uh, yeah, I just, I'm just waiting and lull. Nothing to do but watch tape. Yeah, you can always, one of them, uh, yeah, it would be very weird for you to like record and then like, you know, watch it you know, hours after the fact with one of those three things. Whereas with Bellator <laughs> and UFC, you know, PVRs are there for a reason. You can uh, you can check out the fights after the fact. But hoping everything goes well with that. Thank you for blessing us with your knowledge as always, Cody. For producer Megan and Cody Saptic, I'm Paul Shaughnessy saying goodbye and good luck. Oh.